2.31, so maybe we should just get started. Um, if people keep coming in, that's okay too. Um, so yeah, just welcome everybody. Um, just, just as a note as well, we will keep the meeting open a little bit uh, longer afterwards if people want to just keep chatting. We did, uh, this kind of came out of the symposium and we had a follow-up meeting on Wednesday um, about, you know, how to keep supporting each other and people were sort of, came out of it that people were missing the, you know, the little contact that you have in the hallway or getting your cup of coffee and those little chats. So yeah, we'll, this is one thing we are looking at maybe opening another space as well of where people can get together as a, in a semi-formal setting. Um, but we have also decided just to keep this open if people want to linger, grab their cup of coffee and their nibbles or whatever. Um, yeah, so during the presentation, if you can just make sure that your microphone is muted because um, otherwise any you know, rustling of paper or anything that you make, um, or dogs barking, <laughs> it will get picked up. Um, and yes, we are recording it as well, just for your information. Um, so today we do um, welcome Christian Murray. He's coming up to us from Murdoch. Uh, he uh, has done his doctoral thesis on, on the precariat itself. So that's what he's going to, well, won't be sharing that with us, but I guess it's connected also. Um, he has been done some publications which can be found in the journal Cultural Economy and Time and Society and a, two, and a couple of book chapters in Social Structures of Global Academy academia and the postdoc landscape invisible scholars he also has public work helping out with the Fremantle network event called politics in the pub and he's works with the international bateson institute which we might hear a bit more about today as well and also works with chorus kitchens that provides introductory it training to senior citizens so yes we'll welcome christian he does have some slides to share, so I don't know if you want to pop them up now. See if that sharing option worked. How does that look? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, right. wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Dorinda, for arranging this and for everybody involved. Uh, thank you also to Sally from Taza for sending up the word to everybody. Um, this is just a wonderful thing to do on a Friday afternoon, so I'm, I'm really excited. Okay, so my topic is precarity and the pandemic. Now, some of you will have seen the abstract that I sent out a few weeks ago, and it was on a different topic. So it was on precarity and career development in higher education. This talk is not that talk. That talk might happen in the future, but this one is uh, a little bit more exciting and a little bit more spontaneous. I know that in... Uh, the social sciences, we're at our best when we're looking at history and we are loath to comment on what's yet to happen as a matter of rigor. But there has been invitations from the Australian Sociological Association, from Murdoch University, from any number of organizations to focus our efforts on the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's an opportunity that I've decided to take. So with that in mind, uh, today's talk is going to be relating precarity to the pandemic, but I want to point out that this isn't necessarily my area of expertise. This is a, a response to a historical moment, which I think that we're all digging into. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoy hearing the thoughts that have been going on through my mind. Okay, so the last thing that I want is for you to have death by PowerPoint. So I ask that as I go through these slides, focus on my face, if you have to read this and look at me at the same time, um, yeah, you'll notice my spelling mistakes, all kinds of horrible things will happen. So it's best to focus on the face. So here's the outline of what we're dealing with. So um, as was mentioned, I do a number of different things. So I'm associated with the International Bateson Institute. I'm a university teacher and I work for Meals on Wheels, effectively, delivering meals to senior citizens. Each one of these usually separate domains, domains which uh, don't have very much to do with one another, all of a sudden are being faced by a singular issue. So my interest is how is this playing out behind closed doors and realms that usually don't touch? So this is what we'll be doing. We'll be doing some background on my PhD, showing how I went from thinking about precarity 
to the pandemic. I'll then be giving some initial observations on COVID-19. Now, my reasoning for this is there's been great work put forward by Deborah Lupton of uh, the Monash School of Arts faculty have put forward all of these different ideas for potential areas of research during this time. And it's exciting stuff. So if they're doing that to prompt thinking, I figured that I would do the same. So you're more than welcome to help yourself to these ideas and explore them as you will. Once I've done that, I'm going to be digging into the notion of cultural trauma. So not everything that is said in the cultural trauma literature applies to now because this is the present moment. The idea of cultural trauma is trauma takes a long time mm -hmm. to be uh, realized and discussed and really embedded in the history of a people. Nonetheless, there's some great ideas there, which if you bring it together with systems thinking can actually be really insightful. Once I've done that, or rather as I'm doing that, I'm going to be giving examples from higher education, from Meals on Wheels and from the International Bateson Institute. And finally, I'm going to just conclude with some more reflections and invite you to chip in. Okay, so when I finished my honors, I went to work at the University of Hong Kong before I began my PhD. And I came across an article in a Christmas special of The Economist called The Disposable Academic. So in this article, the anonymous author argued that the long-standing tacit contract in higher education had broken, the contract being uh, punishing low paying work now for a secure and high status job later. It, uh, it's a difficult thing to read when you're an aspiring academic. I think that we all know the emotional response when people start talking about higher education in terms of economics and instrumental outcomes. The article concluded with this paragraph. As this year's new crop of graduate students bounce into their research, few will be willing to accept that the system they are entering could be designed for the benefit of others. That even hard work and brilliance may well not be enough to succeed and that they would be better off doing something else. They might use their research skills to look harder at the lot of a disposable academic. Someone should write a thesis about that. So I ended up being that someone. My PhD was accepted last year and it's called the Precariat PhD on disposable academics and the university system. A lot went on in this thesis as, as does in every thesis and I will not be covering anywhere near all of it. But the key ideas that came from it were that widespread casualization, so employers wanting to be flexible, plus proletarianization, whereby wouldn't it be nice if people just did what you told them to and they didn't have a professional autonomy that is usually expected in many different sectors when you have those two dynamics come together, you have a growing precariat, uh, a group of people who are not only insecure, not only on limited, ter limited term employment, but suffer a raft of um, what could be seen as personal troubles, um, increased uh, sense of not wanting to do anything which could compromise future employment with somebody who could be a proxy employer, a feeling of disposability, um, the ongoing search for work, even when you have work, all of these things. Okay, I argue that these conditions and consequences can be observed in higher education. And I pointed that out by writing about the academic precariat. So Guy Standing, who was the examiner for my PhD, he made the point that we're living in a time where your level of educational attainment won't necessarily save you. Okay, you have people who have the highest degree in the land and they're scrapping together work uh, in order to effectively make um, $50,000 a year. So finally, I said that this reflects systemic changes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, they're not limited to higher education, but they do impact higher education and academics in distinctive ways. It's, it's um, seen as a bad move to discuss the low sim market for academic positions to aspiring academics. If a PhD candidate asks you about it, you do need to be quite careful that you don't um, deter them. But at the same time, there is a well-founded concern for these people. Okay, so there are four factors of precarity which are relevant to 
this current crisis, but there's one in particular, which I will be focusing on and I'll return to in a moment. So the four characteristics are the first one, contingency and dependency. So paid work becomes unreliable and it depends on networks. Uh, so your PhD supervisor, uh, somebody who you met who implied they might be able to get you work somewhere down the track if you could only find their email address. Um, and a great deal of unpaid work for labor. It takes a long time to tailor a resume. Okay, it can take a long time to write a cover letter. All of these things, all of these things can be absolutely exhausting. And the response when you put all this time in could be, we had a great many applicants, you were very talented, but there's a lot of talent out there. We encourage you to apply in the future. Do not respond to this email. Okay, so this re influences the relations that people have with one another. You know, all of a sudden your colleague uh, could be a proxy employer, which is, uh, um, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that when you don't know if somebody's trying to get something out of you or not. It leads to a precariatized mind. Now this is the key, this is the key for the virus. So when you're juggling multiple insecure and limited term jobs, it leads to a sense of time and disarray uh, of having no control over time. You um, can't commit to attending that wedding in November because you don't know if you're going to be working or not. You can't plan your holiday to Bali or your holiday to Rockingham or wherever it is that you go until you know what you're going to be doing at the time. But it's difficult to plan ahead because the horizon of possibilities narrows as you go from job to job. Um, some of the aspiring academics that I spoke to were saying things like, I will get offered a job, but it would be one that's outside of my expertise. And I would be waiting to get word for the other job that I've applied for. So I would be putting off saying yes to paid work in order to hold open the opportunity to have a job that I might not even get. So it's just juggling up in the air, suspended animation. Um, I describe that as the precariatized mind and so does standing. The third is marginality and occupational identity. So there are a lot of people who are talking about the precariat by saying we've always been precarious. Um, the, the, the global South has always been precarious. Uh, these people are already privileged. What are they complaining about? The point here is that your sense of marginality is proportional to the people that you work with often, your sense of value. If you're told that you're not allowed to have your name on your door, then what's all that about? If, if you don't have a door at your workplace, then that does separate you from the people who do. So it's these small little distinctions that get made between the tenured core and the tenuous periphery, which does uh, concern people and it leads to different attitudes towards what should be the same profession. So we could describe that as a kind of elite disappointment. And finally, Standing talks about this. This culminates in the four A's, anxiety, oh God, have I wasted my time? Um, am I spending my time as best as I could? Alienation, I'm doing work that I don't feel any connection to. I'm pumping through students, uh, just marking. Anime, I can't establish a sense of norm or a sense of routine. I thought that I was entering into academia and instead it's something else which I don't really recognize. And finally, anger. So one way that I talked about this in my PhD was through a chapter on academic quit lit. Now I won't linger on this for long because it's, it is not joyful material. But the point is that these authors, these aspiring academics, they choose to go very public about their decision to quit academe, to go and find work elsewhere. And the way that they describe this is incredible. They were liking it to death. They were liking it to a, a sense of mourning, mourning their previous life. So here are just a few quotes. I can share these slides with people if they would like. Um, my identity was so tied up with being an academic that contemplating not being one was something like contemplating my own death. It was terrifying and paralyzing and profoundly awful. Here's another one. The harder I worked, I fought naively, the more likely I was to get a job. Optimism is a hard habit to kick. I mourn what my career could have been and I struggle to redefine who I am now. 